Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. You want a quality education that will give you a skill set that will make you marketable for the jobs of today and the jobs of tomorrow. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach from Metro Atlanta. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent also from Atlanta, currently in North Carolina. And I'm David Williams, and I'm a dad from Chicago, Illinois. This week in the news, we will discuss the article by Scott Jasek, How to Get New Students When Campus Tours Are Out of the Question. Mark and Anika will discuss Chapter 114 in 171 Answers to the Most Commonly Asked College Admission Questions, Where Can I Find Merit Scholarships? Our question from a listener will be, My son struggles in geometry. Should he take the ACT now as a sophomore since he just took the course? Our interview will be with Taylor King, the Assistant Director of Admissions for Columbus State, on what regional colleges have to offer. And our college spotlight will be the University of Cincinnati. Friends, a lot has happened since last week. First of all, David and I actually recorded it last week quite early because he was hitting a road for one of his emergency medicine trips, and he works the graveyard shift, so... Doing them after that, he thought he'd be wiped out. So it was like 12 days ago, and so much has happened in this new corona world we live in. And we'll get to that in a second. It has. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, But I'm going to start with a few announcements. Uh, First of all, for those of you who are regulars, I'm sure you've noticed that the last five weeks, my sound quality was off. And I just want to really thank you for your patience. I tried everything at multiple meetings, got new equipment, and no improvement. Finally, I got a new mic. And hopefully you're noticing that I'm back to the sound quality that we had before. But just wanted to thank you for your patience and hanging in there during our technical struggles. As far as college admissions announcements, MIT has finally capitulated and said Roberto Duran style. For those of you boxing fans from 30 years ago, no moss, no moss. No more subject test requirements. They were the only school that was requiring the subject tests. And just this year alone, I had three conversations, one at the highest level with them, pleading with them to drop this requirement, and they were not having it. But it took COVID-19, and they finally capitulated, sending an email out yesterday saying no more test score requirements for the subject test. And on behalf of all the students out there, hallelujah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Backflips, backflips. College board has canceled (laughs) the May SAT, which is very significant. And then the June SAT possibly may be canceled. And actually, Dave and I will talk about that a little bit more after our article today. Another major announcement. Every year, 3.3 million students take AP exams. Well, those are also at the start of May. This year, they'll be taking them online from home. Wow. And Dave said in the last episode that Lauren was back from Yale. Now, Joy is back from Georgia. Semester going virtual for the rest of the term. Thrilled to have her back. Although I don't feel she's getting the same experience and she's desperately missing her courses and her professors, which she loved. But we're loving having her home. Dave, every time I turn the TV on, I see uh, an emergency medical doctor being interviewed. So can we expect you on Good Morning America or something here in the future? Well, I don't know if I'm going to make Good Morning America, but I'll definitely make the podcast. (laughs) And and on that note, I (laughs) would like to make a correction. You know, last time we talked, we must emphasize as this coronavirus, the information is constantly changing. And I think I mentioned at the time that the coronavirus predominantly affected elderly people and that the young were less at risk. Well, no longer did I, uh, no sooner did I say that than all these news articles started to appear about all these young kids completely ignoring all the shelter in place advice. And uh, the beaches on Daytona Beach were packed and in Los Angeles and parties everywhere. And shortly thereafter, 
new statistics came out that showed that unfortunately the young certainly are at risk for coronavirus. In fact, tonight on the evening news, which uh, is the 23rd or 4th of March, they mentioned that 42% of those who are coming down with corona are actually between the ages of 20 to 44. And in that cohort, up to one half of the ICU admissions are younger kids. So the take home is that our information on this coronavirus is constantly changing, that indeed the young are at risk. It's a very, very serious disease. So for all those who mistakenly took my misinformation for an excuse to go out and party, kids, please stay home. Not only are you at risk of infecting the older members of your family, but you yourself are at serious risk for illness. This is a very, very serious pandemic, and it's not to be trifled with. So my apologies, but the take-home message to that is the knowledge that we are having on this disease is constantly changing, and it is a serious disease for everyone concerned. Yeah, I just thought uh, today, I think, over a hundred deaths in the U.S. just alone today, and what's happening in New York is pretty scary. And Dave, I know you head out to Connecticut. What within the forty-eight hours to the emergency room? I head out to Connecticut earlier in the week. I have no idea what I'm walking into. Yeah, it's getting pretty serious. It's getting pretty serious. Uh, the biggest issue is the shortage of protective equipment, and I joked about it last week, but in fact. I went into my garage and pulled out about 10 industrial respirator masks from Home Depot that I usually use for my home projects. And just in case, I will be traveling with my own set of masks. So hopefully uh, the situation is not quite as dire as in New York City, but New Haven and Manchester are just a stone throw away. And Connecticut is one of those states that has totally shut down all interactions that are not deemed to be critical and they do have shelter in place rules uh, for all concerned. So it's, it's a serious matter. You know, you remember last week when I went back to Maddie college, had a flashback. Yes. I just had another flashback. Do you remember Dave about 25 years ago, you were on the cover of the New York times with your hard hat on it's like, right. like banging away, hammered and nails. Do you remember that? I do. I do. <laughs> I recently purchased some. Friends, what you don't know is in addition to being an emergency medical doctor, Dave and his wife own a whole bunch of properties, and he has a hobby. He likes to do the work and go out and fix them up and do the flooring and do all that. So it was a New York Times article, Harvard doctor, you know, banging nails, working on a home. I just had <laughs> just had another flashback when you talked about all your stuff you keep for your home projects. Yes, actually, it was an interesting flashback because it's the only time I've ever appeared on the front page of the New York Times. And I was in a hard hat and painter's outfit, and I was with a crew painting a fence. And my mom at the time called me, and she was so embarrassed. And she said, you're on the cover of the New York Times, and you're wearing that? <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> but for all you folks there that was about a good 25 years ago wasn't it dave Maybe it even was 30. It, it was a while ago it was haven't made flashbacks. the new york times since but, <laughs> but that so was friends good. you're gonna get some flashbacks with that with us and dave well let's transition right. here so our admissions tip for the day is particularly for those of you using the common application there's a section on the common application that says future plans. And what a lot of you don't know is whatever you put in your future plan section, your whole application is seen somewhat through that prism. So they want to see if you say, for example, your future plans or you want to be a pharmacist, then there's going to be a certain expectation for certain strength that you're going to demonstrate in science, maybe some clubs that you're in. It'd be nice to have possible science teacher do any recommendations, grades in those types of courses, test scores in those types of courses will be looked at very differently than if you said you want to be a writer for the New York Times. So just keep in mind, well, future plans is something that actually gets looked at a little bit more closer than I think some people think in a holistic review. 
And for our emissions vernacular, the word of the day is Maymester. You want to take a stab at that one, Dave, or pass? Oh, wait, Maymester? I've never heard that. What, tell me that again. So Maymester, what a Maymester is, these are courses that are shorter than a six-week summer session. They occur in the month of May. You get to immerse yourself in the course or topic or studies in like a three-week format. And the shorter session allows students to earn credit, but still pursue other summer opportunities like jobs and internships and things like that. So it's not something that every school offers, but we'll be doing College Profile today in the University of Cincinnati. They're one of the schools that offers Maymasters. Awesome. Awesome. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. All right. So the article for this week is by Scott Jason. And it is how to get new students when campus tours are out of the question. And Mark, we had mentioned uh, just in our last couple of podcasts how because of the coronavirus, Everything has essentially been canceled. I know that for my daughter, the traditional Bulldog Days, which is a really big event where all the admitted students get to visit Yale and get a sense of what the campus life is, uh, that was canceled. And that for many schools, this is the main venue that they have to convince all the kids that have been admitted to actually choose their school. And so this article deals with how are, what are some of the strategies that the colleges are now employing in the absence of the spring tours to try and get students to actually choose them. And it talked about a couple things. They talk about basically everything is switching to online or different types of venues to try and introduce the school to these students in the absence of the students actually visiting. So it profiled, first of all, Texas Christian. And Texas Christian started to open up a web page for admitted students. It talked about Kenyon College that used to have a very personalized admissions letter that actually mentions each student uniquely by name and would invite the students down to the colleges for a visit. But they had to cancel that whole portion of their admissions. It talked about Oregon State and Southwestern University that had to extend its reply deadline from May 1st to June 1st and mentioned that many other schools are considering extending their deadlines for at least a month. It talked about an interesting company called Platform Q Education, which specializes in producing online videos for schools specifically to introduce the school to admitted students. And it talked about this particular company had to take a typical in-person event on campus that usually lasted about 90 minutes and compress it to a video of only 10 minutes and try and convey the same information in 10 minutes that a student would often get in a 90-minute session if they visited the campus. They talked about the University of Tampa, which years back had to switch the way they were marketing to students because one of their major catchment areas, New York City, suffered a huge hurricane and they were unable to actually get recruiters to that area of the country. So in place of that, they began a half hour online question and answer session where people could log online and actually ask questions, uh, basic questions like, how do I find a roommate? And what are the courses like? They talked about the University of Missouri, which has instituted webcasts every Tuesday on a specific admissions topic. And then they also talked about universities such as Lawrence University and Caltech that realized that the same programs that they were using to recruit international students, they were then going to employ for their domestic students, since these students, like the international students, could no longer visit their campus. In fact, Caltech has instituted a series of videos so that each dean 
of their school would create a 10 minute video introducing his particular program to the students. And that's the way that they were trying to get the students informed about their choice. The whole crux of the article was essentially that in the absence of students being able to visit the campus, schools were scrambling to come up with different ways to relay the information necessary for those students to make an informed decision and to transform an admission into an actual acceptance and getting those kids on the campus. And it really relayed an underlying sense of anxiety, almost panic, that a lot of schools are facing right now because they realize that in the absence of campus visits, they may find their yields seriously impacted and they may find that the actual students they have showing up on campus is going to be very adversely impacted. Uh, I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to you, Mark, and say, what say you? Yeah, Dave, that was an outstanding distillation of the content of this article. You know, this is a tough time for everybody. I just want to extend my empathy. I'm finding I'm doing a different type of counseling right now with the students I work with, the school district I'm a director of college counseling with at KIPP, as well as my private clients. It's just a very difficult time. You know, you have seniors who, in many cases, have not visited some of the schools they're admitted at, and they're being told the admitted student visit days are canceled, and they're literally going to have to make the decisions off of their computer and conversations that they may have with certain people. And then for my juniors, the test scores can't being canceled are really throwing a wrench in their plans. No idea whether the June administration is going to be canceled. And then so many of them had planned big trips during spring break to visit, and now those are canceled. But this article conveys the fact that it's not just the students. You communicated it well, Dave, when you said there's a level of panic. And as I talk to college admission officers, there is a level of panic. They're, quite honestly, freaking out because all of their yield models, they can throw them out the window if they don't get a chance to get students back on campus. They have no idea. Are they admitting Mm -hmm. enough students, too many students, too few students? Remember, tuition for the majority of schools pays the bills. So there's a lot of pressure on the admission offices. And as I have conversations with schools, even very prestigious schools with very strong brand strength, there is an element of real concern saying we don't know who's coming. Are we going to have to go really, really deep into our wait list? for those who even have waitlists. And this article conveys it. And here's something the article says, which I think kind of conveys that sense. So it says, this is talking about University of Tampa, school I like a lot. Tampa does separate videos for students and their parents. With the parent videos, one recently prompted more than 400 questions when it went live on the internet. That's right. Still, the admission officer said, They don't get to see our palm trees. So, you know, schools have relied so much on getting the students back on campus. You're really interested in petroleum engineering? Guess what? We'll set up a meeting for you with with somebody in that department. Career center services are important to you? Let's set up a meeting for you over there. And on and on and on. We can go down the list. You want to play volleyball? Let's have a talk with the volleyball coach. So, You know, it goes on and on. And they're resorting to very creative uses of the Internet. You're going to hear an interview later today I did with Taylor King. And uh, Taylor met actually twice in my home in preparation for this, my home office. And one of the things Taylor has been doing is 15-minute Zoom sessions with students. By the way, one good thing. But I did get out of this, Dave. You know about that Zoom stock? It's up 132% year to date now. <laughs> That's one yeah. good thing for this corona. At least I got to find a bright light. Well, I, I must say. A silver lining somehow. Mark has been my financial advisor during this whole crazy time with the stock market. And he's introduced me to the concept of 
limit <laughs> buying the stocks on market yes. and limit limit orders limit and he doesn't realize <laughs> i'm an er doc i have attention deficit disorder <laughs> I, I just yeah, want to like, buy the darn thing this limit orders man <laughs> methodical approach and he's like no nah, i just want to get it over with <laughs> buy the stock That's yeah. right. but this is the challenge schools have is how can and for some schools it's really a problem because they're so far behind Later this in this episode, you're going to hear me do a college profile of, of the University of Cincinnati. Go right on Cincinnati's website. The first thing that jumps off at you, the very first thing, is their you visit virtual tour. It's wow. so interesting to me as I look at different colleges' websites how prominent in they're making their video tours. Uh, some schools are getting really creative. They've reached out to their faculty. And they've asked their faculty if they would be willing to do 15-minute Zoom sessions with students who expressed interest in their major. And many faculty are like, sure, you know? Right. I mean, I don't want to lose my job and we can't pay the bills. And besides, I want to teach great students. So it's just, it's an interesting time. And schools are freaking out. They have no idea who's coming. And they can't get you on campus. So they're using the internet in some really powerful ways. And that's the essence of the article. But Dave, you and I have a lot of, we've been talking every day this week as we normally do about a lot of different things related to college admissions and COVID-19. And I remember last week, you know, we weren't sure whether or not you were going to get your refund back. Remember that when we recorded? Yes, yes. And I, and I must say, kudos to Yale they refunded me $3,700 uh, for the room and board that we are not going to use for my daughter. So I'm very grateful to that. And then shortly thereafter, my daughter informed me that they were spreading out all the remaining graduate students to the undergraduate dorms so that they will now be using her dorm to basically house their graduate students so they could have that social separation among the remaining graduate students who are on the campus. The only issue I have is that her stuff is still in her door. <laughs> so her, her clothes, her suitcase, her personal effects. And so I still haven't figured out how we're going to collect it or what the details are for storing it over the summer. But I'll figure that they'll figure that one out. <laughs> so I was a tad jealous because, uh, of course, Joy's off campus. She was on campus two years off too. So when you're off campus, you're in an apartment, tough noogies. Like I'm just paying for that apartment while she's home about a grand a month. And I'm not getting anything back there, but got an email today that said your student, Joy, was here for 54% of the spring semester, which meant 46% was remaining. So guess what? You will get refunded. 46. You're getting the refund. For, no, not the tuition because, you know, they're expecting you to do the online for that. But they said 46% of the student center facility fee, 46% of the student activity fee, a portion of the health fee you'll get. But then they said there's certain fees you're not going to get. They said if you had a dining card, a meal plan, you'll get 46% of that back. They said consistent with, I'm reading this actually, the University of Georgia guidelines, UGA will not provide refunds for tuition, special instructional fee, technology fee, or the Connect UGA fee, as these remain critical in supporting students in the continuity of your instruction. I partly mentioned that for you to realize all the different student fees that go involved in, in going to college as well. But looks like some kind of refund will be coming back. But Dave, you and I had an interesting conversation. Uh, a couple of days ago, I'd love for you to recount it. You had it with Lauren. Why don't you share what you said about if this thing goes into the fall? Because I thought that was interesting. I think our listeners might find it interesting. Well, I I'll first start with an anecdote. This morning, I'm up having breakfast with my wife, and my wife mentions, you know, Lauren's online classes start today. And I said, they do. And says, yes, yes, she's supposed to resume her courses. 
And we had set up a little desk in our hallway and we had our computer all set up and I was all psyched for her to have her little place where she could be doing her online courses at Yale. And I noticed that that desk was suspiciously empty. So I was like, it's 930. Her courses start at nine. Where is she? So I knock on her bedroom door and I peek in and there's my darling daughter in her bed in her pajamas, with her iPhone out, looking at the tiny little screen while she's horizontal, taking in her chemistry course. (laughs) And and I said, this is not how I want my Yale tuition to be spent. (laughs) And I was getting, I I was getting your feeling, Mark. I'm like, hey, I'm getting a little ripped off here. (laughs) Why don't you get up, get dressed and go to this little study desk that we set aside for you? Because I just couldn't see substituting your education for seeing this whole thing on your little iPhone screen. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but more to the exactly. point, we had the discussion and my daughter asked me, well, what happens if for whatever reason the college announces that we can't come back to the campus in the fall and that we have to continue our education online? And I looked at her in all seriousness and I said, you know what? In that case, I would advise you to take a gap year. And she asked me why. And I said, because so much of what we're paying for is not just taking classes online. It's the whole experience. It's the social experience of meeting new people, of forging those friends, of forging the connections, of being involved in the clubs, of being involved in all the different, uh, the research projects. Uh, To add to this story, my daughter had, arranged to do research on campus for the summer and had arranged an amazing research fellowship, which was going to be paid on the Yale campus to actually do climate change research. Well, that they sent her a note saying that, unfortunately, it looks like that will also be canceled and she'll have to make other plans. So we have things she's going to do, but it was disappointing to know that such a crucial aspect of her education which is the summer research or the summer experiences or the summer abroad for all these students is now going to be canceled. And that's at the point where I thought, you know, it's not worth it paying $50,000 in tuition, even if we get the room and board back, because that's not my concept of the education that we're paying for. And I told her, how would you feel about taking a gap year and doing whatever, getting a job, doing traveling if it's uh, possible, doing another internship, and just returning when, in fact, you can truly have the experience that you expected, that we intended, and that we're paying for. And you know what? She was all in on that. She said, that'd be fine. My wife was a little bit reticent, but that's the way I feel. I mean, I did not pay all this money for her to have an online education especially if it's going to be from the confines of their bed on an iPhone. (laughs) So I don't know. I don't know if anybody else does. Yeah. It's interesting because there's one side of me, and we talked about this a little bit last week, Dave, that really believes this could be the black swan event that is the disruptor for higher education. Yeah. You know, the internet has disrupted almost everything. Very, not that much disruption in the, when it comes to healthcare and really not that much disruption with higher ed. I right. mean, sure, you've had organizations, you have for profit groups out there like 2U and K-12 and you have the MOOCs and you have the hybrid model and other organizations we've talked about in the past like edX and Coursera that have made inroads, but not really in a dramatic sense, not overhauling the system in the way Amazon is like disrupted malls and so many other things have been transformed by the internet. So there's a part of me that sees, wow, people get could get used to this, see this is less expensive. It has aspects of efficiencies and they could be attractive. But there's the other side where this could also really reinforce the value of the residential experience. 
Right. You know, and I see both sides there. I definitely feel like what my daughter's getting right now with her virtual classes and watching professor lectures and then doing papers is not the same for the same reasons you mentioned. So you would feel the same as I do. I do. Absolutely. And I would not pay next year if this is what, you know, I'm not, I don't think we're going to have this problem in the fall, yeah. but you know, it looks like it's taken around 10, 12 weeks to run its course based on what we see in China and South Korea. Of course, they did a much better, they're doing a much better job than we are, of, you know, preventing community spread. So we'll see what happens here. But no, it's this is not what I pay for. And of course, Joy has the Hope Scholarship and I'm in state. So I'm paying about a third of what you're paying. But I still feel that way. But, you know, there's one other thought I had on this, Dave, and I wanted to share. And this is I've been thinking about this a lot because I've been thinking, how is what's happening with Corona going to have long term ramifications yes. for higher ed and college admissions? One of them is what you and I just spoke about, of course. And that could go both ways. But here's another one. And I just, I, I was thinking about this. I think, and I'm going to make a prediction. If the SAT ends up having to cancel the June administration, I think you will see colleges in droves go test optional. I think the way that they'll market it is we're going test optional just for this year. Yeah. And there's so many reasons why they would do it. One, because they want to tamp down the anxieties of students and parents who will be freaking out. Two, because a lot of them have wanted to do it anyway, and this provides an excellent litmus test, an excellent laboratory for them to see how they can admit kids without use of test scores and have some real data. And another reason is because they like to have high average scores. And if they're losing out on these administrations, then their test score averages are going to go down if they have to rely on people taking scores when they were much younger. So I think you're going to see that in droves. And I was planning on coming on, and I thought this was the most profound thing that I was going to predict. And then literally today, an email comes across my email. Email comes across my email. Duh. <laughs> I open an email. And the University of Georgia, which is a whole system, 27 schools, basically says for this year, for all the schools other than really Georgia and Georgia Techs who are tech who already passed their deadlines, they're going test optional for the entire state. Got that email today. Yeah. So it's not the most bold or outlandish prediction. And that's one thing like this, I'm not going to say is going to signal the death of the SAT or the ACT. I don't see that, but I think it's going to accelerate the test optional movement on steroids. I think a lot of schools are going to go test optional just for this year in their initial announcement. But then depending on how well that goes, they could very, very easily roll that out for future years. Any thoughts, Dave? Yeah, I'd like to second that because we have talked before how this whole coronavirus could be a sentinel event, an inflection point. We've already talked about how online education is on the verge of transforming education. It has been for many, many years. We've talked about the technological changes with high-speed internet, the need to be flexible to adapt to people's stages of life for the adult learner, the increased focus that people have on getting value for their colleges, especially in times of economic downturn. And I think that this event that we're experiencing, this pandemic, is not just going to accelerate these changes, but what we're seeing here is actually going to stick. I want to share a, a conversation I had with my brother, very bright guy. In fact, and Andrew uh, or Michael? This is Michael. This is Michael. Both okay. of them are internet entrepreneurs, and Michael in particular was is a very successful corporate attorney who for many years rose up the ranks of uh, HSBC Bank to become the chief financial officer and then went into private ed equity and now manages 32 financial managers. So he's pretty big cheese. In fact, I can honestly say that in our family, it's the dumb one that went to medical school. <laughs> but, but he was saying that it was fascinating because he was saying that two things has, has really driven home. The first thing is that companies really feel 
that they never want to get caught in this situation again, that this whole pandemic has driven the financial system to potential collapse, and that viruses are never going to go away, that we had the warning signs with H1N1, with swine flu, and now we have corona, and next year it could be something else, and that they always must have a plan B in place. And the second thing is that they have immediately switched to everybody working from home. And every day now, he has the same corporate meetings, but it's now on video. It's now on webcasting. And that in, they found a couple things. Number one, almost all of their employees under 40 years old love it because they've been brought up on the internet. They've been brought up on Facebook and Instagram. And that ironically, they found that their productivity has not really dropped significantly by having everybody work from home. What they've also found that the corporate costs could potentially plummet. If you are a big corporation and you've rented out this big downtown office space and now you've got everybody working from home, what's going to happen the next time you're going to renew your lease? You're going to say, we don't need all this office space. So you could totally decrease the amount of overhead by having more and more people work on home, more and more people communicate online. So when he, I was talking about the changes that we talk about in college education, online education, video webcasting, colleges getting rid of transportation costs and instead advertising their accepted students to college online, he says those changes are going to stick. They're not going anywhere because they have efficiency of scale. They have increased productivity. They have the acceptance of most young people under 40 years old. And they have the added benefit that the next time we have a virus, they've already got all these structures in place. And they say, no problem. We will never be drawn to the brink of financial ruin again. We already have an online way of delivering the same services that we used to do in person. So I thought that was very significant. So, you know, once again, when we look at what they're doing with Texas Christian, with University of Tampa, with University of Missouri, with Caltech, just because this coronavirus is over in eight weeks, I don't think they're going to abandon this. I think they're going to expand on this. And just as we talked about places like Purdue and Arizona State having large percentage now of their revenue from online courses, I think you're going to see a wide adoption of all schools, including the Ivies and higher selectives, as they realize that this is the way to survive, not just economically, but basically biologically, as we have this constant threat of viruses that could be disrupting the way that we've done business to this point in time. What do you think, Mark? Dave, I agree with everything you said. But let's transition, or this will be one of our long, long, lengthy conversations that we have every week. (laughs) We got a five-part podcast. (laughs) Absolutely. But that was good stuff, and I agree with everything you said. Excellent commentary, my friend. Now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Anika! I know you're not a work from home kind of girl. How are you transitioning? <laughs> As to be expected. Oh. Is that the million dollar question? <laughs> it's going to be fine. That's all I got to say. It's going to be totally fine. What's your policy? Is it just your work from home until further notice? Pretty much, yeah. And we got our first case of coronavirus from someone in our on, from our campus that tested positive. Oh, that wow. Was a big so that's even yesterday. more. Yeah. Now, was that amongst an employee because all the students are gone? Well, of course, they didn't say much. You know, it's just a member of our community has tested positive. I would imagine if that person was around a certain group of people, they would have contacted those people already. And I have not been contacted. So, <laughs> um, right. it's no telling. Good, good yeah. knock on wood. Mm-hmm. But the students have all left. So, there would have to be an employer staff, right? I would imagine so. Yeah. I mean, it really couldn't be a student. Haven't they all gone? Well, now I've heard that, you know, some students don't have anywhere to go. So I guess maybe a couple of international students that can't leave. So I'm yeah, I wondered about international. Mm-hmm. I hear you. I don't figure for some internationals, they probably do that. 
And then what about you? Like, do you like jog to get away or do you like run to the store? I, like, how I, do you? I just found a track close by. Oh, Someone told me about okay. where we're staying right now. And it is nice. the best thing that has happened since life spread. So, yes. Oh, good. <laughs> so, are you like doing once a week or have you upped your game? Uh, well, I mean, I literally just found it like a week or so ago. Okay. So, we, I mean, we, yeah. I, the lady introduced me to it. We're, we're like going together, social distancing still. Here, I but. hear you. <laughs> you got to get it in because sanity is critical for these points in time. So. so I have to tell you this. So, you know, because I'm, I, I enjoy working at home, but I can't, I have to at least one time get away every day. Mm. And so I was like, I got to get away. Joy, do you want to like run through, drive through, or go to Walmart or something? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so we're driving and I asked her, she's, you know, she's an excellent critical thinker. So I asked her, I said, what ways do you feel this COVID-19 will have a like permanent impact on our lifestyle? Are there any ways that you think this will just be fleeting and pass over and be evanescent? And she was like, right away, she's like really good critical thinker. She said, first of all, I think everybody's going to be extremely conscious about washing their hands and using hand sanitizer. And she said, I don't think that's going to change. We're basically all going to be germaphobes. Secondly, she said, you know how like people are having this problem, like going to the store and can't get TP, can't get soup, can't get, you know, paper towels. She said, I think people are going to hoard in advance so that they have their like <laughs> month's supply. <laughs> and, and, then the, and then the third thing she said, which I thought was pretty profound. She was like, personally, I don't like virtual classes, but some people do. And I think there'll be a higher percentage of people that will do like online school and hybrid learning and virtual school because some people do like it. She said, it's not for me, but I think we will see an increase in that. I just thought those were interesting insights. Yeah, that is interesting because I, I, I think the opposite actually around the virtual classrooms because people, that it like reinforces the value of residential and all yeah, the, yeah, all exactly. the, pen of, all the value added. Mm-hmm. So I wonder yeah. if she's just, I mean, she has, I'm sure she has a peer group that is, you know, said that they, they enjoy it, but I just wonder how many more, just can't wait. I know Janae specifically, like, get me in a classroom, get me around some people now. Yeah, Dave and I actually talked about this, you know, in our sections, and we both sort of have the same belief, like, this is reinforcing the value of the residential learning experience. But mm-hmm. in a weird way, we also think that it'll also cause more growth of online. So I think kind of both are, both are true in yeah. a weird way. We shall see. All right, Anika, so we're looking at uh, our third week in a row, we've taken a look at merit scholarships. And this week, we're getting really more specifically into how you actually find them. And I know normally when we're doing like the book chapter, normally I start off by having you kick off that part. And then I make some comments afterward. But if it's okay with you, you mind if we kind of reverse it and I start out and then you chime in? Oh, it's just fine. So you've heard me talk a lot, I'm sure, about common data set, Mm -hmm. you know, in the past. Does that sound familiar? It does. Yeah. And so that's a great starting point for this process because the common data set does have the most robust quantity of information when it comes to, in general, how many merit scholarship each school gives away, how many recipients how large the average one is. And so for our listeners who are new and they're not really familiar with the term common data set, let's do a real brief overview again for you about this. Uh, Common data set is actually a product from the Common Data Set Initiative. And it's a collaborative effort amongst a bunch of data providers in the higher educational community. The three big ones are Peterson's, the College Board, and U.S. News & World Report. And so they've combined to provide this accurate and timely data to help basically students, administrators, publications, really everybody in the higher ed world. And it is regulated. There is a a committee that monitors it to make sure that they're doing what they need to do. And it delivers this detailed information in a very set format. Most colleges will list it on their websites. There's no like commondataset.org or commondataset.com or anything like that. Most colleges will actually list it on their website, uh, normally in their institutional research section. There are a few colleges that decide not to participate in the project, 
but the overwhelmingly majority of colleges do, and even a higher percentage of the of the selective colleges do. And so when you go to the common data set, you'll find a bunch of sections like section A is all about general information. Section B is enrollment and persistence data. Section 3C is like freshman admissions information. Uh, section D is all about transfer admissions. And then uh, I'll skip ahead. Section F is about student life. G about annual expenses. And then H is really where you'll find all this. That's all about financial aid and scholarship information. So there's a couple ways you could get this. For you people who like to do your own original research, you can just go right to the common data set. And you're really going to be focusing on a section H, grants and scholarship section. And if you go like to section H1, you'll see Fed State and institutional money. And that's what you're going to want to look at. It's going to be divided into two columns. And you're going to want to go to the second column because it focuses on non-need-based aid, which is basically merit aid. So the first column is about need-based aid. Second column is about merit aid. So that's the first place you want to look and get a sense of how much money is the school giving away. Then you want to go to section H2G, and it will tell you the actual number of students from the school, each college, that got non-need-based aid or merit aid. And then the other big thing you'll want to do is jump down to section H2O, and it will give you the average dollar amount. So is the average merit scholarship 3000 or 25000 So that's like the purest way to do it if you're into doing your own original research. Not everybody wants to do that, though. So there are some shortcuts. You could go to the website bigfuture.org and do a college search uh, for any school you have in mind. Then you want to click the Pane tab, and then you could go to Financial Aid by the Numbers, and you'll see these great colorful charts, and it will show you the average non-need-based aid there. They're just taking this information from common data sets. So if you don't want to do all the work yourself, then you can use that source. My favorite source to use, however, is collegedata.com. You are going to need to take a username and a password out. Once again, do a college search. Go to the Monies Matter tab. And what I like about college data is not only will it tell you the average award, but it will tell you the the percentage of students that get merit aid. So those are basically where you want to do your background information if you really want to get a sense of kind of merit aid overall. So let me um, ask you, can I ask you a couple questions, Mark? Sure, absolutely, because I'm going to say something else in a second. Go ahead. Okay, so the first part is, is when I've been to the Common Data Set before several times, and I, yeah. first of all, I didn't realize it was the collaboration between those three you know, institutions, but either way. Yeah. So when we're assessing that information, is it clear that, okay, this is what a student gets average by year, by semester? Like, is it broken down to that extent? or? So it is going to be annually. Okay. Okay. Once again, the thing people have to realize, let's say it says the average merit aid award is, I'll just make a number, $10,000. And by well, major. People Let me need, throw that in there. Let me throw that in there. And by major. Oh, yeah. Nothing's there by major. Okay. You know, it is by year, but people need to remember, average does not mean that's what they get. It just means it's average. Right. It might say the average merit award is $10,000 and 23% of students get it. Well, that means that 77% are not getting it. Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length, Usually, it will be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes, it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that 5000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, 
just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. And there's one more tool that is extremely helpful. And I'm going to put a link to this in the show notes. This is if you don't want to do any of this research yourself. So Jenny Kent and Jeff Levy, they're a couple educational consultants in the same organization I'm with, HECA, which is a professional development organization that kind of holds us to the highest levels of professional ethics and standards. And what they have done, and they do it every year, is they've gone through and mined all this data for everybody. If you don't want to, like, go to all these websites, they put together a document that has every college. It'll list the total cost of attendance. It'll list um, how many undergraduate students are at the school, the percentage of need that is met. So is this a school when we talk about meeting full demonstrated need? Does it meet 48% of need or does it meet 100% of need? Uh, so that's a need-based assessment. And then it will say the percentage of students that get non-need-based aid or merit aid, and then the average aid award. So basically, they're just taking the information from Khan data set. In fact, they even have another column that says, what is their source? And of course, the source will tell you it's common data set 2018, 2019. They generally produce this document every August. And the one that I'll link to the show notes will be August 2019, the most recent one. And so this is, if you just don't want to do any of your research at all, you just want to go to a chart, it'll all be laid out there. However, just because a school is listed and it says we give $10,000 of average merit aid award or we give zero and we give it to, I'm making up numbers, 23% of the population, how do you go from there, Anika, to figuring out what you're likely to get at school XYZ? Let's say North Carolina A&T or whatever, Davidson or whatever school you want to think. Uh, the book chapter talks a little bit more about that process. Um, anything you want to chime in and share? I'm going to refer back to the chapter and I'm going to start with the six points that you list out. And darn it, let's start with the first one, the financial aid and the scholarship section of the school's website. Like, would that be the number one start, right? No, absolutely, because this is where you're going to find out what the criteria are. Mm -hmm. So the the background information I gave you just lets you know how plentiful and how abundant or the lack of abundance Mm -hmm. of merit scholarships at schools. It's not going to tell you what the qualifications are, whether you meet them. Okay. And and so that's why you want to use this in conjunction with the school's website. Okay. And let me... No, I was just going to go ahead and jump down to the next one that I believe that we want to focus on. And that is another website called, well, we talked about this, where well, you talked about this before, capex.com and collegegreenlight.com, where they match your profile up against the available scholarships. So they're literally, there we go with the profile information of the students to say, okay, you qualify for X scholarship within this institution. Yeah, and those websites also do a really good job of letting you know what the merit scholarships are for the school. Like they'll say, they're, you know, they have a $25,000 one and they have a $15,000 one. Mm-hmm. That's a real quick way mm-hmm. to take a look at what your various schools are offering. I'm still a proponent of always going to the website, though, because it can be more details. I have found that CapEx does a good job of being pretty current. With the, what's on the school's website, but I'm still trust the school's website. The yeah, most. I was just about to add. I, that's you just took the question around. I'm not. But I was going to say, how current are they up on? You know, getting all the information from the school. That thing. I find they're usually pretty current, but mm-hmm. what I find is there'll be even more details on the website. So okay. if I'm doing a real quick search, I can. I may want to use that really quickly. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, if I see something I like, I'm going to that website. I, if it's a school you're interested in, don't skip the go to the website section. Let me be unequivocal okay. about that. Okay. And that's okay. where you're going to get the details. And I know next week we're going to get a, do a little more of a deeper dive into how you evaluate it. So I'll hold off talking about that now. But okay. this is really the best way. You know, if you just go to the website and you skip the first part, I think you oftentimes will have a harder sense of knowing, like, what are my chances of getting this? Like, is this something that is highly likely for me to get or highly unlikely? The times when it's going to be not a problem is going to be when it's all based on a grid, right? When it's all by the numbers. Then you can just go to the website. If you have the numbers, you get it. If you don't have the numbers, you don't get it. But if it's a lot more cryptic, that's when 
having that background information from either the document I'm going to link or doing original research, you know, common data sets, original research. You want to do original research, all of it is there. If you're more of a shortcut person, then you could use these other sources. That's going to give you a good overall view of the likelihood and the probability that this school offers a lot of money. But it's going to be the website that's going to allow you to say, well, how do I stack up? And what are the specific qualifications? And do I meet them or do I not meet them? Okay. So what's going through your head? Any questions? No, I just, this next one is one that I almost forgot about. And this is actually your point number five on here. When you say signing up for scholarship alerts when you take the standardized tests, such as the SAT, the ACT, even the PSAT, there's an opportunity there to sign up for scholarships based. And this, and, and let me, I guess a question around this, is it based on your scores from that test that they match up against those scholarships? Would that be an accurate so, yeah, certainly they use the buy list of names. Part of it is targeting based on scores. And they can either offer you something right in the mail off of that, or they can, you're now on their radar and you may get special direct mail offerings from colleges. Mm, okay. All right. So, I actually want to, I know those are the three key ones, but it's another one on here that you list. And it's about working with your school counselor. And I'll tell you that Janae got another scholarship thanks to her school counselor which was nice. So, you know, they've been working together really well, you know, them connecting them to resources, counselors connecting the students to resources, scholarship resources, period. Like, that's just another source of information for them. Yeah, absolutely. And that comes in particularly handy when it comes to outside scholarships. Mm-hmm. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right. So this week's question is from Keisha from Ohio. And Keisha says, my son is currently a high school sophomore and he has a low B in geometry. He is really concerned and thinks that he should probably take the ACT this year because he doesn't feel that he would really retain any of the information, of the geometry information. What is your thought on this or do you have any suggestions? Because we have, we've been looking in our local area for math help. I'm um, assuming she needs a tour with no luck. All right. I appreciate Keisha asking this question. First thing I want to do is talk about a debate that you'll see amongst test professionals. And the debate stems around this question. If a student is generally not that strong in math, is it better for them to take the ACT or the SAT? And there's some compelling arguments on both sides. So the argument that it's better to take the SAT would be the following. The ACT has a lot more advanced topics math on on the test. It has more trigonometry, and it has a lot more geometry. Actually, about four times as many geometry questions, where the ACT has more like advanced algebra. So if you're not the strongest math student, that argument goes, why would you say take the ACT, which is a more STEM-based test, much more higher level math, a wide array of math, and then you'd be better off avoiding that and taking the SAT where you don't have that wide range of math. But however, there's an argument for the ACT, which is also fairly compelling. You would think, well, gee, isn't that it? Like, no brainer, case closed. Like, you already told me there's four times geometry. and Keisha said her kid's not that great at geometry, so isn't it an easy answer? Just take the SAT. Well, here's the argument on the other side. The ACT has four sections, right? It's got an English section, a reading section, a science section, and a math section. So the argument for the ACT that some test prep professionals will say is math is only one quarter of your composite score. So if you're the weaker math student, don't you want your math score to be diluted and only to compose and comprise one quarter of your composite score, whereas with the SAT, it becomes one half of your overall score? Does that make sense, Anika? Uh-huh. Yeah. So both of those arguments, you know, are really pretty strong, right? Like, of course, you'd want to avoid geometry. if The test has four times the geometry and more advanced topics math and more trig and go for the test that is much more of an emphasis on higher-level verbal skills, which the SAT is. Very strong argument, but also a strong argument 
if I'm not that great at math, then I don't want math to be half of my overall score. I'd rather it be a quarter. And so I say all that to say one thing that all test prep professionals will agree on. And I used to do test prep, did it for a year, and it just was not my thing. I don't think I've ever told our listeners that I did test prep for a year. But all test professionals will agree, myself included, there is one way to resolve this, and that is to take practice tests of both the ACT and the SAT, see which one you're better at, and go with that. So Keisha just kind of assumed, should I take the ACT? And that's very common. What happens is most of the time you live in, the ACT or the SAT is just the more popular test. And so people just kind of work off an assumption. If you're in ACT territory, you you have an ACT mindset, you're thinking about the ACT. If you're in SAT territory, you're assuming you take the SAT. And what I want everybody to do is not to sit back and even use that information. You could use that information I shared as background information, about four times as much geometry on the ACT as there is on the SAT. And what the other information I shared about math being a quarter of your overall composite score on the ACT and a half on the SAT. But what I want everybody to do is take real practice tests in a time situation, can use a set, a friend, a sibling, or a parent as your proctor, sit down at the table, no line on the bed, chilling. No, mom, I need five more minutes. Adhere to the real-time constraints. Take real practice tests, and they're amazing practice tests. We have some of them on our Your College Bound Kid website. You have to go back to our ACT and SAT episodes, like 43 and 44, but they're there. And these are former tests that you can actually take and then compare your score and go with the one that you're better at. So that's what I want Keisha to know. That's what I want our listeners to know. Any questions, any thoughts, any comments, Anika? Yeah, so what about her point about him being a sophomore and him taking the test now? So does that, when does that come so, into play? Or does it come It's a good play? question. See, a lot of times the thing about geometry is you get geometry in the sophomore year, but you don't ever really get it again. Mm-hmm. So it's not like being a sophomore is too early. It's not like it's too early to take the test. But I wanted to focus more on how does she know the ACT is her best test? The first thing is to go through the process to figure out if it's your best test. That's the first thing. Now, there will be some people that will say there's a lot of brain development that naturally occurs between 10th and 11th. And let's say it turns out that the SAT is your better test. That's hard reading on the SAT. They've made those the reading comprehension very hard in the new redesigned SAT that came out in 2016. They're taking lots of passages off of the AP language curriculum and putting them in there. So if you're not exposed to higher level vocabulary, higher level critical thinking, a lot of times students are going to do better in the 11th grade. So it's 10th grade is a good time to get some exposure, but there's a great chance that your best score will likely occur in the 11th, even, you know, spring of the 11th, depending on the student. Okay. So when is the earliest time that you can take it to have an official score? Oh, you can okay. take it anytime. Like you could take it within five years of when you go to college. And really? It can, so ninth no. graders can take the test yes. and it out and be done. Correct. But chances are that you're not going to do, like I see students have substantial score improvements from ninth grade to their spring of 11th grade scores. I can imagine. For that genius out there. For a lot of reasons. For one, there's a lot of Algebra 2 on both tests. Mm-hmm. And if you haven't really mastered Algebra 2, your, your chances of doing really well in the math is not going to be good. So in general, 10th grade is an okay time to start having some exposure to the test. But the chances are you're not going to have your best score in 10th. I like to see students in, you know, start prepping for, take advantage of the summer between 10th and 11th. That's when I like to see them start to take advantage of that. And at that time, really it's best to do practice tests. Because if you're applying to a school that doesn't practice score choice, you have to report every score. Why report your scores that you know are not likely to be your best? Now, occasionally I do work with whiz kid genius types 
that are banging out the 1580s in the 10th grade. I do have those type of kids. And if you're one of those kids, then go ahead and knock it out. But most of us are not that genius type. Well, Keisha, good luck. At least and... I'm not. <laughs> or me. <laughs> I'll speak for myself, not Anika. No, let's go ahead and put me in the block. Uh, but I would love to hear from Keisha if her child takes those, you know, both practice tests, SAT and ACT. And I'll be curious to know if he got on top of the SAT. That'll be interesting. Absolutely. Keisha, you have to report back to us with an update. So as Dave mentioned, we're kicking off a new interview and it's with Taylor King. And what Taylor is going to talk about is a regional public. What is a regional public university? How it differs from a flagship? how it differs from a liberal arts college and who's a good student for a regional public university. And what are the reasons for attending a regional public university? I think you're going to enjoy it. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, I'm here with Taylor King the Assistant Director of Admissions at Columbus State University. Welcome to the Your College Bound Kid podcast, Taylor. Hello. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Good to be with you, Mark. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, friends, let me tell you how I met Taylor. You regular listeners know that I also work for KIPP, where I sit in upwards between 140 to 200 information sessions a year, depending on the year. And Taylor came by and did just an incredible presentation, I thought, this year of Columbus State. He also trained one of my coworkers who I work with. He used to work at Columbus State. And we got to talking afterward, and I thought he would be uh, a fantastic guest for a a topic that I had in mind. But before we get into that, uh, Taylor, why don't we kick it off by having you talk a little bit about your backstory, your upbringing, and walk us all the way up to where you work now and what you're doing. Sure. So, you know, I'm born and raised here in Georgia, uh, in the Western Metro Atlanta area and just love my life growing up. It was a great time. I have a twin brother. And so that always made things interesting. Um, especially when it came time to go to college, uh, we could not have gone any further apart than we did or than we wanted to. We wanted to be as far away from each other as possible. That's just brothers, right? You know, fighting all the time and stuff, but we both had the opportunity to play baseball in college. And so that's really what the driving force was for me. Um, it, you know, academics were important, all that, but I won the opportunity to play and went to a small college in Southwest Georgia, Andrew College, and played my first two years and then transferred to Reinhardt College, now Reinhardt University in Northwest Georgia and finished my last two years. And while I was in school, I fell in love with higher education. I knew at the time, you know, this is going to be a career that I wanted um, I didn't know exactly what in higher ed I wanted to do and had the opportunity to start my professional career as a director of residence life back at Andrew College. So I was able to serve there and love my time in student affairs and housing. But if you've ever lived in a residence hall or been an RA or even at the professional level, um, it does take a toll on you. And so uh, mm-hmm. I was looking for a way to stay in higher ed. I was living on campus, so I wanted to find a way to not even be in the office, but still be able to work on a college campus. And I found that with being a regional admissions counselor with Columbus State. And so I was able to move back closer to home, which was great, and have been with Columbus State ever since and just progressed, continue to progress through, you know, where I am now as the assistant director. I didn't know you had a twin, fraternal or identical? Oh, definitely fraternal. We do not look alike at all. He is about six inches shorter and about 120 pounds lighter than I am. I always find it fascinating how some twins are like completely inseparable. They act like, you know, like one's the left hand, one's the right (laughs) hand. And then some are like you, like, you know, let me me establish my own identity and not be seen through the prism of being a twin all the time. Right. Yeah, that's definitely how we were. And he actually went to the Savannah College of Art and Design and when they had a baseball team and played there. But he was definitely that more artsy type person where I, I do not have the abilities that he has. So. And we get along now, you know, we're, we're best friends now, but at the time, man, we were at each other all the time. (laughs) Hey, I hear you. I hear you. Well, friends, we've talked a lot on our podcast about liberal arts and science schools. We've talked quite a bit about flagship universities, but one very important type of university we haven't really talked that much about are regional public universities. 
and Taylor works for a regional public university, and, and that's really our topic of the day. What is a regional public university and who's a good match for a regional public? So, Taylor, why don't you uh, start by defining, you know, a regional public university for us and uh, let us know what it is, you know, how it differs from some of the other type of universities that are out there. Right. So to me, a regional public, the public part's the easiest answer. So uh, we get all of our funding through the state and so through taxpayer monies and that and that helps drive our tuition down. Um, and that's important to know. The regional part, you know, it depends on the school. But for us, regionally means locally here in the south. Mostly, most of our students come from in-state or within a border state or two. And so we really draw primarily from that local. When I say local, I mean local in the sense of statewide area. And so for some regionals, uh, they draw more from a southeastern area, or they may even draw from a more condensed area. It may be more of just a city that they draw from. But for us, it's more all of Georgia and Alabama would be our big ones. And so it differs from a flagship in that we are not as research driven as a flagship university might be. Uh, a lot of flagships are have you know many doctoral programs, very graduate and professional school focused, where we are not. We are mostly undergraduate and graduate school focused. Uh, we do have a doctoral program that's going to be in education. And so we do not have a professional school, and most regional publics do not offer professional schools, uh, such as law school, med school, all of that. So uh, we are primarily undergraduate and graduate school focused. The difference between us and the liberal arts is we're going to be a little bit larger than most traditional private or liberal arts colleges. And so there's a little bit more of a population. We can offer a wider variety of majors. So they're not just in the liberal arts. They, you know, in a regional public, our majors truly go across the board. So there's a lot of variety within uh, academic programs there as well. That's great. Uh, Sometimes I'll I'll see regional publics referred to as master's level institutions, meaning, you know, you've got a lot more master's offerings than your liberal arts undergraduate schools, which tend to be almost exclusively undergraduate but then not as many PhD programs as the flagships. Uh, So a pretty, you know, nice array of offerings for both uh, bachelor's programs and master's programs. Does that sound fair? That's absolutely correct. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. Friends, whether your child is a senior who was planning on visiting colleges you were accepted at, or your child is a junior or sophomore and you planned on visiting calls this spring, COVID-19 has changed everything. So what are you to do now? You need to go virtual and watch the best virtual tour each college offers. The good news is that virtual tours have never been better. But how do you know where the best virtual tour is found? Is it at UVisit, which is now EAB, by the way, YouTube, the college's own website, campustours.com, or Campus Real? All of these are resources that we have featured in the recommended resource section here before. You always want to go to the college's website, of course. But here's a great tip to find what virtual tour each college thinks is their best one. Go to commonapp.org, search for any college you're interested in, and on their main page, you will see a hyperlink that says virtual tour. Click this link and you will be taken to what these 900 colleges think is their absolute best virtual tour. It could be one of many different sources. Now this only works for the 900 colleges on the Common App, so if it's not a Common App school, Just go to Google and enter the college name and best virtual tour. We will now return to my interview with Taylor King. So if you're talking with somebody and, you know, they're considering a flagship or considering a a liberal arts and science school, what case would you make for them about why they should consider a regional public? Like, what do you see as the advantages? Well, the biggest advantage to me is cost. Mm -hmm. While we are not as let's say affordable as a community college, you get the opportunity to go away from home, stay in residence halls. Most regional publics do have residence halls and you get to have that college experience 
and you're doing it at a smaller institution, typically than the research levels and larger than the liberal arts colleges. So that nice and medium sized university. So a lot of the public regionals are going to be anywhere between five to 6,000 upwards of 15 to 18,000 students. And some go a little larger, some go a little smaller, but generally that nice medium size, 10 to 15,000 students. And so you're still getting diversity of people. You're getting a wide array of different students, but it's not as large as, say, your large public uh, flagships that can get upwards of like 40, 50, 60,000 students. And our cost, like I said, that's going to be the biggest driver for a lot of our students. We're not as competitive and we don't use holistic review. There's some you know, regionals uh, that will use a holistic review, but for most of us, we're going strictly based off your test scores and your GPA. And so that makes us a little bit more accessible than a lot of those other schools as well. That's helpful. Now, I know one of the criticisms sometimes of the regional publics in general is that graduation rates tend not to be as high as some of the flagships out there and some of the especially more selective uh, liberal arts and sciences schools. You know, oftentimes around a 40 percent graduation rate can be pretty common. What would be your response to that criticism? Yeah, so for us, and we track this, a lot of our students and a lot of students at regionals transfer. Whereas a lot of students that are going to flagships typically stay all four or five years. And that's where that's where the graduation data is coming from. It's going from that four year to six year graduation date. But it doesn't take into consideration the students that transfer either to us or from us. And so when we track that number, the number of students who start with us and then complete elsewhere, our graduation rate's closer to like 86 percent. We've done an excellent job of tracking those students and making sure they're finishing somewhere. Most students that come to us are your just typical everyday high school student. And so realities hit, you know, financial situations or uh, somebody gets sick at home and those students need to go back and they need to transfer elsewhere. And so that's where a lot of our graduation numbers do suffer compared to a lot of our peer or like, you know, research institutions. I'm really glad you got to clarify that because that's definitely something the public doesn't know. Let's dive a little bit more into that 86%. So how do you come up with that number? How's that tracked? So what we do, uh, we use the clearinghouse um, to track that student data and see where our students are going. We also keep in touch with our former students as well and see where they're going and survey them about when they graduate um, and then use that number to calculate what our actual graduation work would be if students were to stay with us. That's great. That's great. And I know you mentioned that the a lot of your students are just kind of average students. Mm-hmm. Put a little flesh on that uh, for us, Taylor. Describe the type of student that you feel would do well at a regional public. Yeah, so academically, most students that are coming to us are anywhere between that 2.8 to 3.2 core GPA. So we look at core and academic GPAs as opposed to more of that holistic GPA or that overall GPA. And so typically those students that are coming to us, that is our bread and butter. 2.8 to 3.2, we'll have some that come in a little lower. We'll have quite a few that come in a little bit higher. But typically that's what we're looking for. Same thing on the test scores. You know, we'll have students who are 30 on the ACT and plus. We'll have students who are, you know, 17 to 20. But most of our students are coming in 21 to 25 within that range. And so just like I said, your average high school student here in the South, on the SAT, that would be more along the lines of 950 to 1100. So that's really the bread and butter of our students. Our students, while they are involved in high school I and mean, they are in clubs and organizations and athletics and jobs, I feel that a lot of our students don't overwhelm themselves with feeling the pressure of going into a, an Ivy League school or a highly competitive research school. And so they aren't necessarily involved as much because they don't feel that pressure to stand out from their peers. Um, And so a lot of them will just be a part of the clubs and organizations or the athletic programs that they want to be a part of. Um, They're doing the service hours because they enjoy doing them, not because they feel that pressure to do them. Next week, our article will be once again, how the coronavirus is impacting college admissions. Mark and Anika We'll discuss chapter 115 in the book, How Will I Be Assessed by a College for a Merit Scholarship? Our bonus content will be how to use the rating sources like Moody's to know if a college is financially healthy. We will be in part two of Kaylor King's interview on the regional colleges, and our college spotlight 
will be Ringling College of Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida. Friends, as promised, our college spotlight takes us to Ohio for the University of Cincinnati. And the University of Cincinnati is a school with unique architecture. Dorms are spread throughout campus, traditional style, apartment style, and freshmen can get apartment style. It's first come, first serve. One of the things they'll catch you if you ever visit Cincinnati, lots of hills, 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 and more hills, and stairs. If you need a good cardio workout, walk the Cincinnati campus and you'll get your cardio workout. Kind of reminds me of Pepperdine in uh, Malibu, which has the same kind of impact there. The campus is a mile from downtown Cincinnati, and that mile is an uphill walk. And you'll see scooters everywhere. Cincinnati's got 700 clubs, 27 fraternities and sororities. Pretty much all the religious groups have their own support organizations on campus. It's a big school. We're talking 36,000 students in total. So this would be a large school. Although it's often overshadowed by the flagship, Ohio State University, which is north of 50,000. So oftentimes can fly under the radar. And that 36,000 is comprised of 26,000 undergrads and 10,000 grad students. And you see, as you'll oftentimes hear me refer to it for the rest of this spotlight, has pumped a lot of money into its school, like over $300 million into facility improvements. Some of the most noticeable ones are the creation of a main street that runs all the way to the middle of campus, an amazing student center, and UC has lots of stores and centers and student activities right on its main drag. UC's Division I with no football, but they are a basketball powerhouse. Women's basketball. While their men's basketball rivalry with Xavier is legendary. And if you want to know about the intensity and rivalry of that matchup, just uh, put in YouTube the Cincy Xavier brawl a couple years ago, and you'll see uh, the level of intensity. Xavier is their rival school, also in Cincy, seven minutes away. Reminds me a little bit of the Duke-Carolina rivalry, which is also two schools eight minutes away. And you see. They admit you directly into your major. So that's important that you you know you're applying directly to a major. So what happens when you apply is you first have to, you have to select what your first choice major is, your second, and your third. And they'll try to get you your first, but if you're not as competitive as other applicants, they'll then go to the second and then go to the third. And then they will ask you if you're interested in an option of general admission if you don't get into one of your top three majors. The focus at Cincy UC is clearly hands-on learning. And at UC, they expose you to service learning in a lot of different ways, internships, co-ops, and so much more. UC is on the Common App. They do a holistic review. Part of their holistic review, they are going to look at recommendations. They use your UC app as your scholarship app. So no additional scholarship applications necessary. Engineering students, which, by the way, is one of their strongest programs, they're going to really look closely at the math and scores and grades in that evaluation, which is pretty typical. Uh, UC also has a very strong business exploratory program and an engineering exploratory program and an overall general exploratory program. UC does, has very little core classes, only those that are really applicable to your major. Now, one letter recommendation is what UC is going to ask for in its admission process. But you can submit more, but they make it clear. Please do not send us more than three. And by the way, that's pretty common for a lot of schools. And this rec can be, it can be from a counselor. It can be from a teacher. It can even be an outside rec if you're very involved with a job or club or sport or in the performing arts or even a religious leader. One of the things about UC that makes them stand out is a lot of inventions that we prize today were birthed right on the campus of UC. Some of these would be antihistamines, the wow. electric organ, the U.S. Weather Bureau, and of course, something they're very proud of, they are the birthplace of co-op education. UC has over 500 study abroad programs. They offer May Masters, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, they also offer semester-long and year-long programs as well. 
and you can also do your co-op abroad. Cincinnati founded co-ops over 100 years ago to be exact back in 1906. It's something of tremendous pride for them. And I did a whole deep dive on what co-op programs are a few episodes ago. If you missed that, it's really worth checking out. You see is the largest co-op of any public school in the country. They have co-ops for more than 40 different programs, and they do over 7,000 co-op placements a year. So most of the business students have a co-op option, and many of the business students can even do an international business co-op abroad. Uh, usually, co-ops are done in the second semester of the sophomore year at UC. Now, remember, this is different for every school. We talked about this when I did co-ops. You got to look at the details because they're different. But at UC, it's usually second semester of your sophomore year. You can't do them as, as freshmen. And one of their strongest programs that they're most known for, it goes by the acronym DAP. That's D-A-A-P. And these are all co-op programs, five-year programs, and every one of these programs is absolutely outstanding. Dave, you want to take a guess what DAP stands for? Oh, boy. DAP. Not a clue. <laughs> Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning. So this is oh. one of their strong programs. Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning. That makes sense. And DAP and Music Conservatory are going to be their most competitive programs. So I don't know how many of our listeners know this, but the Music Conservatory is in the conversation for one of the top three music conservatories in the nation. Just truly, truly, truly extraordinary program. Um, they also have a very strong broadcast training program, a strong electronic media program, strong nursing program, strong pharmacy program, strong education program. And then their Linder College of Business, once again, has a co-op option to it. Their engineering and applied science, very strong programs. Everything is five years. And their College of Medicine offers a very unique program as well that prepares students for med school, dental school, vet school. College of Nursing, Allied Health and Science and Medicine are on a separate campus known as their medical campus, which is actually across the street uh, from the main campus. And the College of Arts and Sciences is their general program. And the College of Education, one of the unique features with that program is beginning in the freshman year, students go into classes right away, and the program actually licenses you to teach not only in Ohio, but in 42 other states. So Dave, what have you learned about UC so far? Very impressive. I got to admit that I knew of Cincinnati primarily because of this basketball. But you had mentioned the co-op programs just a couple podcasts ago. Can you just refresh us about the difference between co-ops and internships? Because I think that's very important because I think that's a huge strength of this university. Yeah, so they're both experiential education. They both provide exposure to the real work environment. Typically with internships, you can do them as a, in a part-time basis in conjunction with your studies. They provide that option. And they don't necessarily have to be part of your career planning. Whereas with co-ops, you're literally stopping going to school. They're full-time. They're usually longer, four months, six months, seven months, sometimes summers. And they're actually part of your whole entire curriculum. So you'll have a co-op coordinator that'll sit down and strategize them for you and pick ones to further your career. So you're in the workforce, totally. And when you graduate, you're actually considered someone who has real work experience in a full-time capacity. And for uh, the research on co-ops is 50 to 60% of people that do co-ops actually get an, a job offer from the actual place that they do a co-op at. So it can be a, a fantastic way for you, one, to figure out what you want to do the rest of your life. You try a couple of different co-ops and see what you love. Two, Find out what it's like to actually be in the real world and out of the college bubble. Three, get real work experience. And then four, make some money because usually co-op jobs are more on like the national average is 17 to 20 an hour. One student I know, Dave, who was at another fantastic co-op school in Northeastern. Now she was a superstar. Okay, so I don't want to get it twisted. Like it's always like this. Her senior year, she co-opted Google 
while still at Northeastern. And Google paid her $6,000 a month and gave her $2,000 a month for living expenses. Oh, that's so amazing. they don't all pay like that. Yeah. But is that helpful, that overview? Oh, I think it's extremely helpful because, you know, once again, we really emphasize value. And I think Cincinnati provides value on multiple levels. Not only do you have a significant opportunity to defray the cost of college, but more importantly, you're getting valued experience on the job training while you're in college, which leads directly to great job opportunities. So I'm very much of a co-op fan. Uh, you know, we're both Canadians, so we are familiar with University of Waterloo and its co-op program. And then through your podcast, I've learned that Cincinnati is actually the founder of the co-op programs. So a wonderful opportunity to get a great education, to get great experience that leads to great jobs, and to defray the significant costs of college. So it's a triple win as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and speaking about the University of Waterloo, I don't know if I've ever said this on this podcast before, but both my brother and my sister both went there. That's right. Well, another thing Dave and I have in common is half of our siblings are in the States and half are in Canada. So I've got a brother in Denver, a sister in Canada. Dave's got two sisters in uh, New York area and two brothers in the Toronto area. So we're That's both right. uh, going back and forth between both countries there. Absolutely. Some more about uh, Cincinnati. They do offer some dual enrollment options, which can be pretty attractive to the students where they'll double major. Mass communications is one that's pretty common for that. So that's kind of really popular. Now, the area that since he's located in is known as the Clifton area. It's a huge restaurant hub. So that's kind of uh, exciting for a lot of students. It is a self-contained campus. It's an urban campus, but it's set apart from the city doesn't like just bleed into the city. So it's self-contained and plenty of green spaces. For those of you who need your green spaces, you want to go out on the lawn, hang out on the quad, throw a Frisbee. It's got the green spaces and you still get access to the city. 84% of the students are from Ohio. So a lot of their overlaps are in Ohio. Schools like Ohio State, Bowling Green, Miami of Ohio, Xavier, some of the popular overlaps. But nationally, they can compete And they can hang because of the strength of some of their programs like DAP and like music and engineering. And of course, they're, you know, they're co-op, which, you know, ever since the global recession in 2008, people are demanding an ROI if they're going to spend this kind of money. And parents like the idea of knowing that my kid's going to come out with not only a job, but a really good job in their major. And parents also like the idea of having their kids learn the real world for a while and go out and make some of your own money. So that's attractive. And, you know, we've mentioned in the past that how in times of financial distress or financial uncertainty, the element of cost of college and value always comes much more into play. And just in the recent weeks with what's happening with this pandemic, uh, you've mentioned that a lot of your current clients have actually really brought up the whole idea of value much more because people are looking at how are we going to get that ROI? And so I think that spotlighting Cincinnati at this particular juncture is incredibly apropos because this is one of these colleges that have an incredible ROI, return on investment. Yeah, and one of the things that's been striking to that is some of my families that have brought that up have been families that were prepared to pay the 80000 I mean, they right. made good money. But, you know, if you own a business and your business is – Say you own a bunch of restaurants and, you know, and you're dealing with this COVID-19 thing right now. I mean, you know, you're in a completely different financial situation than you were in two months ago, you know? And so it completely is, I'm noticing with my families, it's making them much, much more cost conscious about their college, you know, their college process. A little bit more about Cincinnati. It's not the most racially diverse school, about 78% Caucasian, 7.7% Black. Uh, 3.3% would identify as Latinx, 3.8% multiracial, 4% Asian, 86.1% of students return for their freshman, from their freshman to their sophomore year, 64% of students graduate within five years. You really need to look at the five-year grad rate anytime you're looking at a school that's got co-op because oftentimes built into the course structure is an additional year 
for you to get that real experience. Right. It's a tight campus, 137-acre campus. It's not a place where you need a car if you go to Cincinnati because it's got a great bus system that takes you everywhere, and freshmen get access to that bus system. Um, most students actually live off campus. Freshmen are required to live on campus, but the culture is kind of to move into local apartments close to school for you know sophomore through senior year. So 26% are on, 74% are off. It's not really a big fraternity or sorority school. One in 16 students are in frats and sororities. And as far as the cost of attendance, I'm always going to give you the cost of attendance as an out-of-state for a public because, for one, if you're in Ohio, you're probably familiar with the school anyway. And because most of our listeners are either going to be coming from outside of the state that we were focusing on or another country, uh, cost of attendance, and I, when I list cost. I'm always going to give the all-in cost, including things like books and supplies, personal miscellaneous, transportation, student fees. So cost of attendance out of state for Cincinnati would be $45,000. And they do have some automatic merit money that's not that hard to get. So a 3.5 GPA, a 12.40 SAT, or a 26 ACT would get you about $6,000. So basically that cost of attendance goes from forty five dollars down to 39000 if you've got uh, those type of stats. And as far as the type of students that they admit, grade point average wise, 3.61 is the average GPA. 41% of students have a 3.75 or higher. 21% of students have a 3.5 to a 3.74. 17% have a 3 to a 3.25. But they don't automatically not admit you if you don't have that 3.0 GPA because they do actually admit 20% of students actually would have under a three. So they can accommodate a range. And as far as math goes, uh, 19% of students would have over 700 on an SAT. Uh, 41% of students would have six to 700 on an SAT. And then 36% of students would have 500 to 600. And then very, just, just a couple people, just about two to three or 4% would have under 500. And for Evidence-based reading and writing, fairly similar numbers to that as well, with uh, 60% having in the six and seven hundreds, and then most of the rest being in the being in the five hundreds. And you could just convert that to ACT and have pretty similar to get a feel for that. So that's the University of Cincinnati. I think it's a real underrated gem because it's one of these places that has some exceptionally strong majors. And a lot of kids like to be in the city, but they like a self-contained campus. Obviously, their music conservatory is world-renowned. Their DAP program is world-renowned. And I'm just a huge fan of co-op, as is Dave. So there's another spotlight for you to check out. And that's that's excellent, Mark. And I'm, I'm looking at my little back-of-the-envelope calculations again. So you're starting at a base price of 45000 If you can get the $6,000 merit package, you're already down to 39000 So my next question is, do you have an average range of how – much kids might earn in the co-op program? Oh, co-ops can usually be pretty lucrative. So typically you're looking at around $20 an hour. Okay. And 40 hour work week. So that's uh, 800 bucks a week. Okay. You know? And so, you know, you can do the math from there. You know, if it's a 17 week co-op times $800, you're looking at about 13 grand, you know? And that's just the cash they earn and the responsibility, but just think about what they learn about themselves and about okay. the real world. So once again, you got a uh, cost of 45000 6000 minus for the merit money, 39000 and the potential to make on average 13000 of a co-op program. That means all in, you're talking about a college uh, that has some excellent programs, either in music or design that you can attend for $26,000 per year. That, my friend, is called a screening Now, you don't market. call up necessarily every single year. No. You no, don't necessarily call up every year. But still, the point is well taken. And another yeah. thing about co-op is all the research indicates that people that did co-op versus did not do co-op, their average starting pay is higher. I know right. here in Georgia Tech has one of the strongest co-op programs in the country as well. And the average grad who co-ops at Georgia Tech comes out making in the 70s as a 22-year-old. And it's $5,000 higher than the student that doesn't co-op. And while I don't have the exact stats like that for UC, that's a pretty consistent 
trend that you'll see everywhere that you're looked at as someone who has experience. And so we're going to start you out at a higher pay than someone who just graduates right out of college without work experience. And and I just want to add that I was reading a study about college graduates who graduate during time of recession and that college graduates who graduate and don't find a job often have a lower trajectory of earnings that affects them throughout their college career. And that's why certain groups like Generation X, uh, even if you follow them 10 years after college, aren't doing quite as well as the baby boomers or the generation that came before them because they happen to graduate at a time of diminished job opportunity. Now, we don't know what era we're entering into. The future is truly unknown. But if you are picking a college that gives you a co-op program that increases your chances that much more of getting a solid job after graduation, it just means that your return on investment might be that much higher because you could be one of those few graduates who find that regardless of the economic climate that you graduate in, you're set up with a good job and you can ride out the hard times. So, Yeah, and uh, I think one is, of the yeah. best values, yeah. and this is true for internships as well, co-ops are just a little bit longer and more of a full-time type of opportunity, is to really learn yourself and figure out what you love. How many Absolutely. people do we know, Dave, that are 35 or 38 or 28 and they don't like what they're doing and they're looking at doing a complete career change because they didn't know themselves well enough to figure out what they would truly love? And one of the best things sometimes when someone does a co-op and they don't like it, I think it's actually great that they learned that at age 19, you know, Absolutely. before Absolutely. they went ahead and got a degree and felt stuck and had a job with kids and and marriage and a mortgage. And they feel like I'm stuck doing this thing. I don't, and I hate going to my job every day. Absolutely. You know, I'll say this. I love my brother to death and I'm so happy for him. He just got a huge promotion with a really, really outstanding company, but he languished for 20 years, you know, doing things he didn't enjoy. Um, and I always felt for him because I've always loved what I've done. I can't even remember not loving what I was doing other than odd jobs I had when I was in college, just like to, you know, in the summer, sometimes I took some odd jobs just for a little cash that weren't that thrilling, but I've always had the blessing of doing something I love. And I can't even imagine that, but so many people I know are not in that situation. And, and I think this is a great way to help decrease the chances of that. Yep. I am in uh, You're two off days to Connecticut time. for how long are you there? I am there for about uh, two days time. And how long are you there this time? About eight days. I'll be there for eight days. And, uh, you know, my wife said, if you come down with Corona, just stay there for another couple of weeks. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and guess what? No, you can't dive over to New Haven anymore and take Lauren out to dinner. I can't, and I, I, I can't. That, that tell was you, one of the nice perks. Uh, yeah, I, I, I used to, there was a wonderful, old cigar and whiskey bar there called the owl and i would sneak uh, down there and tell my daughter when you get off class meet me at the owl and then uh we would go and sample some of the restaurants and there were some really nice eats so i am going to be all by my lonesome uh in that whole town with uh no one to spend time with so i'm, I'm a little bumming but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> So listen, when you come back and we record uh, episode 115, yeah. we're going to ask for an update of like, what's it like in the emergency room these days? Is it like a different culture or is it uh, medicine is normal? Well, I'm I'm hearing anecdotally that it's a little crazy. So we shall have to see. You know, once again, I, I'll bring my own supply of Home Depot masks and maybe... I won't have to use them if we get our act together on a national level. But but I, I'm optimistic. Uh, to be honest with you, I remember when I was in West Africa uh, just after they had an outbreak of Lassa fever. And if you know anything about hemorrhagic viruses, that was truly scary. And then I did my internship during the height of the AIDS epidemic. And that was truly scary. So I want to 
just interject a sense of calm and uh, my belief that we will get through this and that hopefully in a couple months we'll look back at this as a as a learning experience and one that was tough, but certainly not insurmountable. So I'm calm about it. I'm almost a little excited because after 10 days of of being at home and going through the honeydew list, I, I can look for going, <laughs> going back to work for a bit. <laughs> Hey, your feelings are mutual. Freight is ready for you to go to, my friend. <laughs> I know. I mean, I've already cleaned out a couple of closets and I've already built a couple of things for my wife. It's time to get back to work. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, safe travels. You too, Mark. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. Your College Bound Kid is produced by Dave Visaya of PodcastEngineers.com. If you find this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that can really use this information. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Our image editor is Tauha Khan. Webmaster is Stalianos Dimitru. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. And if you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like to ask us, and we'll include them on the show. You can just email us at questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.